Thank you, Michelle, and thank you um, for the Friends of Science for having me again after 11 years. Um, as Michelle said, um, 11 years ago, I was concerned and I was telling the then audience that this would all end in tears. And unfortunately, that's where we are today. The good news if there is any good news, is that people are beginning eventually and ultimately to realize that this um, kind of obsession is um, hurting them, is hurting them in the pockets, it's hurting their standards of living, it's hurting their economy, it's hurting their political culture, hurting their education. And um, we, I think Canada is about five years behind Europe. Um, you are blessed with still a lot of resources that Europe has forgone. It's not as if Europe hasn't got any resources, obviously not as many as Canada, but we still have resources that are not being used and um, we're paying the price. You may have heard in the news today that the European Court of Human Rights have ruled that um, Swiss ladies have a right to a stable climate and that as a result, the um, Swiss government will have to adopt more dramatic policies to deal with climate change. We don't know yet what the overall implications are. The emission targets they have adopted are legally binding, but they are hurting people so much that they are basically kicking governments out of power. They're voting them out. They say, we, we've had enough. Enough is enough. So governments say, okay, we will change, we'll change the targets. Well, then the Greens are coming saying, well, you can't do this because you're killing the planet. If they want to survive, they have to change the policies and the law, but they can't do it because the judges say you can't do that. So basically, um, we, we are facing a situation where European governments can't survive and they will be voted out. And eventually there will be governments saying, to survive and to survive our economies will really have to water down and delay and revise our climate laws. And this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. So these are the key points. Um, there is growing protest across Europe about climate and energy policies. Um, this is manifested not just in the protests you see on television, but the, what is called the so-called populist parties, so the parties that are highly critical of these policies are gaining more and more support. And uh, in some countries actually won the elections already. There will be European elections in June and they are um, predicted to win a lot of votes. Um, High energy costs, the stagnation of European economies, the um, high cost of living has made the whole climate agenda a minority issue. So in contrast to my talk 10, 11 years ago, when everyone was talking about climate change, this has changed completely in Europe where the priority today is uh, economic issue, cost of living, cost of energy, climate is really a minority issue for about 20 to 25% of the public across Europe. And I will show you the, the surveys that um, demonstrate the dramatic decline in the climate issue for most the average European. Um, as a result of these protests, governments have begun to roll back, to water down, to delay 
policies because they are beginning to realize that they they are becoming unpopular and they are beginning to realize there are many problems that they haven't anticipated and finally we're as i said um, election ahead in june and there is a, a general expectation that these populist uh, skeptical parties will be the big um, victors in these elections. So you may or you may not have seen in the news in recent weeks big demonstrations by farmers in particular across Europe. Um, they've been the ones most opposed to these policies and uh, standing up uh, for their interests. And as a direct result of these quite, and these uh, protests, they were not just in Brussels, they were in national capitals as well. As a result of these um, protests, governments and the European Commission itself have begun to um, cave in. Um, and said, okay, at least until the election, we won't do anything, right? As they do, we'll, 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 we'll hold, we'll stop, we won't do what we plan to do. Um, we'll see after the election. You know, let's see what we can do. So the EU backed down on, on the farmers' protest. Um, and for the time being, the farmers are, you know, they can see that that um, because there were so many of them and, and quite united front, that the EU were extremely concerned, not just losing farmers, but losing a large chunk of the public at the same time. Um, I mentioned already the European Court of Human Rights and its decision today about telling the Swiss government that they are not doing enough about the climate. Today, uh, ironically, uh, there was another piece of news which I'm sure you haven't seen, and that is that in its draft agenda for the next five years, the EU has decided to relegate climate and shift its main priority to defense. So, as you, as, as everyone is aware, there is just, you know, a limit to how much money you can spend and you have to prioritize how you spend money. And over the last 20 years, most of the priority for the EU was the green agenda the Green Deal, a climate policy. This has now changed and the spending will shift dramatically and probably even more so after the election from the green agenda to the real agenda. Um, the amount of money that people, the, the green vested interests are asking for net zero is astronomical. You can see here, one report in the FT says that the EU needs 1.5 trillion euros per year, per year to meet net zero. I mean, it's just utopian, it's not gonna happen. And the sooner um, the EU wakes up to reality, the better. As I said, even now, before the election, the EU is signaling that it is beginning to shift its priority away from climate, no matter what these judges, these unelected judges tell. And we're talking here about judges telling elected parliaments what to do. That, that's the situation. That, and they, the judges in their, in their ruling said um, it's kind of naive to think that democracy 
would work just with majorities in parliament and that only judges can rule or decide what makes legal sense. And that's why it's so important for judges to tell parliaments what they should do. That's essentially what they were saying today. Um, so we have this huge backlash in Europe, which you may or may not be aware of, but the political class is extremely concerned about it because it's not just farmers, it's voters. And you may have seen elections in Sweden, in, in Italy, in Holland, where the populists won elections. Um, Sweden, for instance, after the, the, the populists uh, formed a coalition government with the, with the conservatives, decided to abandon its 100% uh, renewable target and is now prioritizing nuclear energy. So governments are beginning to revise their climate and energy policies as the reality sinks, is beginning to sink in. Um, the populist parties in Europe are making, uh, when we say populist parties, we talk about skeptical parties, parties skeptical of mass immigration, of net zero, and of other mainstream kind of uh, policy agenda. And they're called po populist parties, I guess, because they are increasingly popular. I don't know exactly why they're called populist, but something makes them popular. Um, and they are becoming increasingly popular. Um, we don't know yet exactly how the European election will pan out, but it is, it's expected that the kind of green and more socialist parties will lose votes and the conservative and populist parties might actually for the first time have a majority in the European Parliament. Um, so what you see in various um, countries, like in the Scandinavian countries, in Germany, in France, in Italy, is in Britain, governments beginning to have second thoughts, governments beginning to send out signals okay, okay, we get your message, we, we, we get it, you don't like this, uh, Malak, it's too expensive, and uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll roll it back a little bit. Um, basically, what they're doing is they are saying, okay, our 2030 target, we'll, we'll make that a 2035 target. So basically, what governments are doing is kicking the can in the long grass. Uh, they're not giving up on the policies. They're just saying, oh, we have a little bit more time. It poses, of course, legal challenges because most of these <laughs> targets are legally binding. And once you start uh, rolling back, uh, the Greens will go to court and the judges will ta tell governments you can't do that because we know what you can and what you can't do. Even if you have a majority in parliament, you're not allowed to do anything without telling you exactly what you have to do. So, as I said, Sweden, France, Germany, Britain, Italy, um, other countries uh, have started this rollback, partly as a result of uh, increasing costs and partly uh, primarily because of uh, increasing hostility by the public. Another interesting development which is also quite new as a result of it is that the European governments are beginning to uh, be a bit more serious about all these disruptions we've seen over the years. Um, so they are cracking down on the radical climate movement, um, so uh, more arrests, 
and uh, some groups are facing criminal investigations, which is unheard of for the last 20, 30 years. They've given free reign to these um, protesters or even in some cases almost joined them um, or encouraged them because governments thought that it would help their policies to have a movement making the case. But as I said, in the last 12 months or so, there has been a rethink um, when it comes to these more radical protesters. So one of the first interesting rollbacks um, was about 18 months ago when the European Parliament no, it wasn't the parliament, it was the, the EU Commission, decided, you know, the Europeans had the plan to ban the sales or sale of, of um, conventional kind of combustion engine cars by 2035. And then in the EU, you have negotiations between different countries to have, you know, come to a final agreement. What happened was that the Italian government, the German government were dead against that because they realized that it would essentially be the demise of their car industry, which is, you know, one of the biggest industries left that hasn't left Europe yet. Um, so they decided we need an exit from this draconian target. And what they decided in the end was that conventional um, internal combustion engines will not be banned by 2035. You can still drive a conventional ICE car if you use synthetic fuels, <laughs> right? So in other words, you, the, the car industry can continue building conventional cars because by 2035, they will all drive either on water or on synthetic fuels. That was the kind of loophole with which they undermined the whole idea of banning conventional cars. So, but it ensured that the European car makers could continue making cars because if and this is what's going on right now. If you essentially have only electric vehicles on the street, on the road, then we will all be driving Chinese electric vehicles because they produce these uh, cars for half the price. And uh, currently all ports in Europe have turned into huge car parks because there are about, I don't know, half a million Chinese EVs being, being uh, exported to Europe and they all are parking at European ports waiting for Europeans to buy them. And so the biggest fear in Europe is not climate change. The biggest fear is cheap electric vehicles from China. This is the biggest fear which tells you that this is not about climate change. Because if, if, if it were about climate change, you would think the best option is the cheapest EVs, the cheapest solar panels, the cheapest wind turbines, because that will solve the, the climate. No more climate change, right? But this is not about climate change. This is about the fear that the Chinese will use net zero to essentially flood the European markets with their green technology, which is what they're doing. So the solar industry in Europe is bankrupt. The governments have stopped handing out money and subsidizing them. So they can't compete with the Chinese solar uh, panel makers. Um, wind industry is in a similar um, situation. They are um, because co costs have increased significantly, they can only survive with huge government subsidies. But that 
decision by the EU that to, to allow car makers to continue with ICE cars because in 10 years time everyone will be driving on with synthetic fuels, whatever these fuels will be, um, basically meant that there wasn't a ban and there won't be a ban for conventional cars. Um, this is how it happened about 18 months ago. I don't know whether the Canadian media reported on it, but it clearly signaled at that time the game is over for anyone who thinks that you is willing to commit industrial suicide by um, essentially undermining its own car industry. The other, so, and, and I haven't mentioned yet how unpopular these electric vehicles are. Um, they are mainly a kind of uh, status symbol for people who are already have two or three cars. So they have another one, um, mainly for the shopping or some, you know, when you only need a car for five or 10 miles or so. Um, so they have another car, so they have four cars now. But they can claim that they are very green because they have an EV. But everyone who wanted to have an EV now has an EV. And now the, <laughs> the sellers are stuck with the EVs because most people don't want an EV. Uh, they, either they can't afford to EV or they live in a flat and don't know where to charge an EV. Um, so EVs have become a headache, not just because of the Chinese, but also because most people just don't want to buy an EV. But and perhaps even more dramatic uh, own goal of governments was to force people to give up their central heating, their gas heating, and buy heat pumps. I don't know whether this is an issue in Canada, I have no idea, but in, <laughs> in Europe, this has gone down like a lead balloon because not only um, do you need kind of very, very modern building for EV pumps to heat properly, um, they also cost three or four times more than your conventional gas boiler. So the German government almost collapsed over this issue before they had to reverse and, and cave in. Um, the EU, as you see, has already taken it off the agenda because it's so unpopular. Um, so this is a very, very unpopular net zero policy. So EVs and heat pumps Essentially, because, you know, we've been telling people for the last 15 years, this will be very expensive and renewables are very expensive and your energy bills are going up because of the renewables. This is all far too abstract for people. They, they get it somehow, but they don't really feel it directly because it doesn't say on an energy bill and you know 15% of that bill is because of the wind turbine on this uh, landowner's land and he's making 10 million because you pay that landowner all the money. So they don't get that. This they get directly. The car they can or cannot drive, the car they are allowed to drive, the way they heat their homes, what they're allowed to do, that has caused huge opposition and a lot of headache for governments as a, as a result. So with some delay, the British government then um, decided, okay, they got the message. Uh, there is within the conservative government uh, and particularly in, in, among their backbenchers in Parliament, a huge and growing group of skeptical MPs who are saying, we can't afford this, 
neither economically nor politically nor technologically. It doesn't make sense. It's too expensive. We have to roll back. Um, so Rishi Sunak, our prime minister, then decided, OK, we will have to delay some of these plans. That, this is the kind of the cheap, easy way out. We'll delay it by five years. But it obviously causes huge uproar among the kind of politically correct sector. Um, but it was the start of a rollback. And once you start and you enjoy it, you can go further. And so people are saying, well, you've, you've rolled back the car ban, the, you know, the ban on conventional car is rolled back. And there are movements to roll back the heat pump policy as well. But there is a strong green wing within the conservative party, which is very influential, which makes basically the conservative party um, is deeply split on this. And so the government is not really in full control of these policies. Even things that Sunak may want to do, he can't do because for instance, on fracking, on shale gas, uh, when he was campaigning to become leader, he promised that he would abandon the, 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 the moratorium on fracking. And when he became prime minister, he realized that uh, 50 or 60 of his own MPs said they would vote for the, with the opposition if he were to allow fracking in Britain. So there is a strong green wing within the conservative a parliamentary party, which makes it near impossible to come to uh, a more balanced, reasonable policy. Um, but the price the government and the Conservative Party is paying as a result of its very, very unpopular policy is that they are hemorrhaging votes um, to one, a populist alternative party, and B, to traditional conservative voters who don't vote anymore. And uh, the, believe it or not, they won the last election, had an 80 majority in parliament. They are now under 20% of the vote. So they've lost essentially more than half of the vote already. So in all likelihood, we'll have election in, elections in Britain Later this year, in all likelihood, conservatives uh, who have squandered a lot of, of the goodwill they've been voted for uh, will be in the opposition. And um, Labour is very likely to, to win the election. And of course, this, you know, you will have elections uh, sometime in the next 18 months or so. Um, any government, any conservative government that doesn't get this right, these policies right, will not survive the, in the long term. They will immediately lose support fairly quickly over this issue because it hits people directly in, in their pockets, in their, their living standards, in, in their um, cost of living. It's so direct. It's not something kind of long term. This is a very kind of direct um, issue people are very concerned about. So this, you know, the conservatives here in Canada will have to think very hard uh, how to minimize uh, the, the cost of any future policies on climate and energy and turn this to an advantage to, for the economy and for the country. It will be a big challenge. But in Britain, it was near impossible to do because the Conservative Party, Parliamentary Party, has such a strong green um, wing, which essentially uh, makes it unable to, to come to any reasonable policy. They are so committed. Their priority is, is the climate agenda over anything else. So we've said, Sunak delayed the petrol car ban, and of course, um, the out 
cry was enormous, but um, and it didn't. It was it came too late. It hasn't shifted public opinion. He had hoped that people who he had lost would, you know, go back to supporting him or the the, the party. But this hasn't happened because it's almost too little too late. In Europe, however, it's very interesting because, of course, the, the mainstream conservative parties in Europe um, have all adopted the green agenda and have, have pushed that very hard and run it for the last 20 years, essentially. But they, they also are beginning to realize that the political climate is shifting. So they are now in their kind of draft manifesto saying, we want to give up the planned ban on petrol cars, um, which is a big thing. Um, will be interesting to see how this pans out. The European car makers are struggling as it is because many of them have really prioritized building EVs because that's what governments have told them for the last 10 years or so. This, you know, forget everything else. The future is EVs. This is where your, all your investment has to go. And now they are stuck with the EVs in a big way. There are very few companies who, you know, who, very few companies who will get through this without major, major upheaval. Toyota might be one of the few uh, companies who are doing, you know, basically focusing on uh, hybrids. But interestingly, it's not just the conservatives who are facing this problem with the unpopularity of very costly policies. In Britain, even the Labour Party has begun to row back and water down and uh, abandon some of their own net zero climate pledges, which has caused all sorts of uh, headaches for the party because they are, their main concern is that they will hemorrhage votes to the Green Party. But as it stands, they, their lead is big enough that they can afford to cave in and, and U-turn. But uh, this has, because they, you know, they, they've pledged to spend 28 billion pounds per year on, on net zero. Obviously they don't have the money, but it always looks good if you make these kind of pledges. But Labour MPs have told the leadership, look, you know what, we, we have other priorities. You know, we have the health service, the education, um, infrastructure, and etc. Et and you want to spend all the money, the little money we still have, on these kind of um, issues that are only really in the interest of a very small portion of the population. So the question here is why this net zero rebellion? How, how can it be explained given the kind of mantra that everything is about the climate, climate change, and saving the planet and so on. And given that Europeans for the last 20 odd years or so have been saying, you know, climate is our main priority and this is our main issue and the Green Deal and climate deal and so on. So how can this be explained? Well, I think I've, I've to, tried to show you a couple of issues that have been very controversial. Um, Europeans have been told that this net zero issue and renewables and so on will make life easier for people. The opposite has happened. They've been told that energy costs would go down. They've gone up. So people are beginning to realize that what they've been told hasn't actually materialized. The opposite has materialized. Um, 
I mentioned the problem in Germany with their plans to uh, outlaw um, gas heating and go for heat pumps. That caused a huge, huge um, crisis for the government, which is still, the government still um, wouldn't be able to survive a election nowadays. They are really in the dumps. Um, and of course, that has been the biggest of all rebellions was the one against the ban of central gas heating. Um, and wherever you had surveys, polls about this, you know, in, in Britain, three quarters of conservative voters said only over our dead body, basically. <laughs> we have seen the backlash against EVs. And of course, the uh, cost of energy or electricity in particular has been such that it's, I don't know whether Canadians can imagine energy bills going up threefold or more, which is what happened over the last two years, mainly as a result of the war in the Ukraine. But now that gas prices have gone down back to where they were before the war, energy prices or the energy bills in Europe are still around twice as high as they were before the war. So energy bills are extremely high in Europe. Uh, millions of families struggle to heat their homes in the winter. Businesses, pubs for instance, and others struggling to heat their pubs and their restaurants because the energy bills are astronomical. Um, energy intensive industries like steel, aluminium and so on, they can't survive in Europe without huge support. So there is um, real deindustrialization as a result of these high energy costs. Um, I mentioned already the big issue, the double issue of a falling demand for EVs and increased concern about Chinese flooding the markets with cheap EVs. Um, whenever you have surveys like, you know, would you support these policies? In most countries, you have huge opposition and politicians are aware of the growing opposition to their own plans and policies. And this brings me to one of the most important and perhaps most established policy theories that um, was established, created 50 years ago by someone called Anthony Downs. And what he discovered already in the early 70s is what he called the issue attention cycle. It's a very, very famous paper he wrote in 72 and where he showed already in the, in the early 70s what happens to environmental policies from start to finish. And what he realized, if you look at this graph, is, and, and he, saw, he, he showed that, I think he had six or seven examples where similar evolution of the issue happened. And he showed that initially, some scientists discover there is a problem. Right? We've discovered a new problem. What you, you name it. And people start really, really worrying. And say, oh, we have to do something about this or against it. So he charted this and he realized there is always an initial discovery. The scientists then 
send this to the newspapers, the newspapers hype it up, then there's a movement. We oppose this. And people will go on marches and oppose it. And the public will say, yes, they are right. The protesters are right. We oppose this. And eventually, governments take action and say, okay, we, you know, you, you want us to do something about it, we'll do something about it. Eventually comes the, what he calls the realization of cost moment, where people are beginning to realize, ah, this will cost us money. Perhaps we're not so opposed. I mean, we are opposed, but, you know, perhaps not today. And this he wrote 50 years ago, and this is exactly what we are noticing today. For the first time, people are more concerned about the cost of the policies, of climate policies, than they are concerned about climate change. And how do we know that? Well, we have surveys. Now let me read this for you if you can't read it. It essentially asked in most European countries, it's a big, big survey, asked, if it was up to me, European governments should do all possible to reduce carbon emissions, even if that means energy bills would need to rise. Okay, you asked, they give an answer. And you see the answer, the percentage of people who answer, yes, that is my priority on the left. And then they ask, if it was up to me, European governments should do all possible to reduce energy bills, even if that means missing carbon emissions targets. And you see the answer on the right. Now, what does this tell you? And this is a survey from January this year. Big, big survey. Um, what it tells you is that a clear minority of Europeans are prioritizing the climate issue over their energy cost issue. And that is the most dramatic change I've seen in the last 20 years, so manifestly, so evidently. And I think European governments are beginning to see this as well which explains why they are beginning to roll back and water down. Climate has become a minority issue. Cost of living and cost of energy is the majority issue. And of course we have the cost of renewables going up, um, cost of wind energy going up, Europe, Europe's economy stagnating and losing um, comparative, uh, com, com, comparative um, competitiveness. So Europe is compared to the global economy, to the US and even to Japan in relative decline. And of course, in such a situation, the mainstream parties are concerned that they will be losing voters, that they will be hemorrhaging voters. And that's what the prospects are for the elections in June, that there might be, for the first time, a center-right populist majority in parliament. And if that were to happen, of course, all bets are off. And that's the situation in Europe which sooner or later will come to a theater close to you. <laughs> Thank you.